So we are in a series called His Story. And the basic concept is, is that when you read scripture, it can feel a little bit random. Some poetry, some instructions, some commands, some history. And we can feel like it's just a collection of things that are random and we try to find truth in them. Once you understand the um, grand story of scripture, it not only helps us understand those individual stories better and why they're there, it also helps us understand ourselves better because we are actually part of God's story. And so this morning, I want to give you just a little bit of a warning. We're going to look at a passage of scripture that annoys most people. This is one of those passages that pastors try to veer away from if you don't have to talk about it. And uh, there's a reason it annoys us. It's because it offends us. And what I want you to know is that when we look into this, you're going to realize that you have even more right to be offended than you originally thought. But there's really good news behind this. So I'm going to ask you just to hang in there through some challenging concepts that the Apostle Paul brings us through so that we have a better understanding of what the overarching story that God is working in our world and in our lives is. It says this, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already, been, uh, already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. So the argument that has been developed up to this point is that whether you're religious or irreligious, it doesn't give you an advantage when it comes to dealing with the sin issues in our lives. Then he makes this case from Scripture, and he quotes prolifically from the Old Testament now a series of passages. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. And I know what you're thinking. Of all the Sundays I had to show up, why this one? I mean, it's a gorgeous day. You had options to exercise. Well, I'm going to ask you just to hang in there this morning because I think you will find that this is incredibly insightful and incredibly helpful. Uh, the truth is, is that we have a tendency to hide from God. That's not just uh, a truth about some people. It's a truth about all people. We're going to look at how people do that. I had a friend who used to play hide-and-seek with his children, and the way he would do it is he would say, okay, let's play hide-and-seek. You guys all go hide, and they would all go hide, and then he wouldn't seek. <laughs> he just wanted some peace and quiet. And they were all in their secret little locations, sitting in the dark with their heads covered, hoping. And, and eventually their resolve would wear down and, and they would come back. And you would think that his cover would be blown, but it's not. Because they would come back and they'd say, weren't you looking for us? And he said, oh, I was, but I couldn't. You are such a good hider. Let's play that game again. And he would just get all kinds of quiet time. Um, our tendency is to hide not to seek. And one of the very earliest stories of human history includes this concept. Adam and Eve had only one rule in paradise, only one, and they violated that one. And it was, don't eat of this particular fruit of this tree, which will release to you the knowledge of good and evil. And they ate of it. And as soon as they did, they realized that they were naked and they were ashamed. So they took fig leaves and they sewed them together and they tried to create a way to cover themselves up. But when they heard the voice of God coming, even though they're covered, when they heard the voice of God coming, they run from him. Why is that? And that is because in the presence of God, whatever we use to cover up our weaknesses and our failures, it all gets exposed before him. And none of us feel comfortable with that. 
Now, the truth is, is we may not all struggle with the same thing, but all of us struggle with something. And we may not all be headed in the same direction, but we all have a tendency to wander away from God. And so this section of Scripture actually deals with why that's true and what we can experience that will help change that so that we're no longer running and hiding, but that we actually become seekers of God. Now, what makes this passage uncomfortable and what offends us about this passage is not that it says that we're not good enough because most of us do not feel good enough at least some of the time. Some of us do not feel good enough most of the time. And here's the challenge. The problem here that offends us is not that you're not good enough statement gets made. That's how we talk to ourselves, isn't it? Don't you do that? I do that to myself. Something I didn't do right or didn't, didn't remember or didn't handle or didn't come through on, and I'll say something like this. You idiot. All you had to do was that. And you couldn't even do it. Does anybody else talk to themselves like that but me? Yeah. And, and some of us talk to others like that too. You idiot. But here's the thing, is that we, we recognize this inadequacy within us, and that's not what offends us. What offends us is what Scripture says. It doesn't, it doesn't just say, you're not good enough. It says, you are no better than anyone else, and that's what offends us. Because for whatever our weaknesses and inadequacies are, we're pretty sure there's someone who is worse than us. I mean, if all else fails, we'll pull Hitler out of the box. Say, so, well, it's not like I'm... If you have to go to Hitler, you've got problems. Like, okay? That's not... If that's your last case scenario, that's not good. So what's going on here? This passage reveals that there's this universal reality of sin, and it grips our hearts in ways that we have trouble discerning and when God comes near, our tendency is to run away. So how do people hide from God? And what I want you to look at is two groups. And the first group is the non-religious people. And they hide from God by seeking control over themselves. So this is how this looks. A non-religious person will say, no one is going to tell me how to live. I will decide for myself. I will make my own rules. I will, I will decide what's good for me. And they'll feel pretty good about that. By the way, they have a couple of problems. Uh, if you go down that road, it sounds like a lot of freedom and a lot, a lot of liberty, but there's a couple of challenges that you run into with that. And the first is, is that if you assume that right for yourself, it is very difficult to say other people don't deserve that right. And then when they do something that hurts us or injures us or takes advantage of us, we say, well, that's not fair. Well, they were making their own rules. If you can make your own rules, why can't they make their own rules? The second thing is, is that there's a tendency when we make our own rules to look down on those who live under rules. You know, those religious people, they're just kind of weak-minded. They're just, they're, they're trying to please other people. They're, they're just trying to, they're, they're trying to feel superior because they're good rule keepers. And so the tendency for people who make their own rules is to actually look down on people who don't make their own rules. And this is a real problem. And so when they look at God, they've got no use for God. God serves no, If anything, he's restricting their life and they don't want him in their life, so he has no purpose or no use. And here's what this passage says. They're going to be judged by the law of God too. And, they, and someone might say, well, that's not fair. This is what I want you to know. I don't think God's going to like hold up the Ten Commandments and go, here they are, how'd you do? You see, what's true is inside of us, there is embedded into us some kind of a moral code. And it has surfaced in every society, in every culture, in spite of the fact there has never been a culture that completely lived by it. How do we aspire to values we've never seen practiced universally? This is a problem. But it's even a bigger problem than that. We do have a moral code, and this is how it shows up. It shows up in the words that you say about others. So you'll see someone do something. Maybe they didn't follow through on a promise to you. Maybe they lied to you, and you'll say, 
they shouldn't have lied to me. Or just say it directly to the person, you had no right to lie to me. You should have told me the truth. Ah, so you believe in no deception, only truth. So how many lies have we told? And we do this over and over again. We have all these internal standards of righteousness, even when we think we're making our own rules. And it comes out crystal clear when we're looking at other people. And I think what God is going to do when we all stand before him, he's not going to hold up his law and say, how'd you do with my law? He's going to hold up our own words and say, how did you do with your own standard? And you know what? We don't do so well there either. Because his law is actually embedded in us. So that's how irreligious people run from God. They want to control themselves and they have to distance themselves from God in order to be able to do that. Religious people run from God by seeking control over God. Now, this is a fascinating concept. All right? So how do they do that? Well, they keep the rules... And the reason they keep the rules, if I give God what he wants, then he will give me what I want. If you were raised in a home where you were given uh, an allowance based on certain chores or responsibilities, I mean, if you mowed the lawn when whatever parent was responsible for the purse strings pulled up in the driveway and walked in the house, you would stand there and say, did you see the lawn? I want my money. Or maybe you were in one of those houses that uh, you, were, you were subsidized for academic performance. Like you get so much money if you get an A. Uh, first of all, I don't think that would have helped me. We weren't subsidized for academic performance. We were punished for poor academic performance, and I still performed poorly. It, just, it was very difficult, but here's the challenge. So you get those A's. I studied, I did my homework, I prepared for every test, I took notes in every class, I did the best that I could, so what? That you would get smarter? No, so that I would get paid. Right? This is what, this is what people do with God. I will keep the rules, and then the deal is, you will give me what I want. And for them, God is very useful. Who are they seeking? They're not seeking God. They're seeking what they want, and they're using God to get it. And that's a problem. So they don't really seek God. So Paul puts us all in the same boat, and this is what he tells us. Until you recognize the universal nature of sin, you will always see some people as lesser people. See, if you're the rule keeper people, you'll look down on the people who aren't so good at rule keeping. And if you're the non-rule keeping people, you'll look down on the rule keepers because they're so narrow-minded and bigoted and simplistic and easily manipulated and all of those things. Everybody's got their reason to look down on someone else. And you can always find someone who's worse off than you are and who do worse things than you do. And this is the problem. This is what we do to medicate ourselves to keep us from recognizing we're not really seeking God. What we're seeking is control. And that's what sin does for us. So, is it true that no one does good? Is it true that no one understands? Is it true that no one is righteous? Because these are the statements that Paul makes. And the argument that Paul is making is not that no one ever does a good thing. He's not saying that no one tries to understand. He's not saying that no one is interested in God. What he's saying is every single one of us are prone to wander away from him and hide when his presence becomes near us. Sin wants us to be in control of our lives. So I will exercise that control either by making my own rules or I will exercise that control by keeping the rules and then expecting certain things from God in return. Sin always finds a way to keep you in control. The passage does not say no one ever seeks blessings from God. It doesn't say no one ever seeks answers to prayer from God. It says no one seeks God. There is a real strong tendency in religious circles to just do what we do to get what we want. 
And this is how it shows up. When we don't get what we want, or God doesn't come through the way we want, we'll say something like this. What use is it to go to church, to read, to pray? What use it? Do you hear the language? You're using God to get what you really want. There's the challenge. So, you said, well, but I know some people who do good things. Yes, so do I. And the question is, why do they do good things? You see, sometimes we need to repent for the bad things we have done, and sometimes we need to repent for the reason of the good things that we have done. This is the challenge for us. So why do people do some good things? Well, sometimes we want to be noticed. Sometimes we want to be appreciated. Sometimes we want to have access to specific groups of people. So we need to repent, not just of bad things, but of the reasons for some of the good things. Maybe we want to feel needed so we do helpful thing and nice things for people. Then they will think they need us around. Or we want to feel important so we do things that cause other people to think well of us. Or we want to feel superior so we can help someone who's always struggling with something that they never get over in their life, maybe an addiction. And we don't actually require them to get better because if we required them to get better, then we wouldn't feel so superior anymore. Sometimes we enable behavior that looks good, but it actually helps someone stay in a bad situation. And sometimes we want to feel powerful so we can do things that make other people dependent on us. Do you see how insidious sin is? This is not just a non-religious thing. This is an every single person thing. The natural condition of the human heart. And the only escape or rescue from this is when the Holy Spirit does a work in our heart. So this is what Paul says. These are very unflattering terms. He says their throats are like open graves. Well, that doesn't sound good. That sounds like a horror movie. Their tongues practice to see. When you open a grave, there's an odor that escapes. Nobody creates a cologne or a perfume called tomb. Nobody would buy it if they did. And this is what he's saying. He said, our words may sound good, but they smell bad. Our lips may look good, but they're coated with poison. We can find ways to use words, not just four-letter bad words, but words that tear people down and put people down. And we can have bitterness that drips from our conversations. And bitterness, bitterness is a disease that is always exposed in our words because bitterness basically says I did not get what I deserve or worse yet somebody else got what I deserve and they don't deserve it and that bitterness just drips from our mouths and we mark all of our paths this is what Paul says we mark all of our paths with ruined relationships wasted opportunity with misery i mean here's the thing if you are miserable you never want to be miserable all by yourself you always want other people to be miserable around you so we experience misery and then we express our misery and then we impose our misery on other people and there's two ways we play a victim card in all of this and the first victim card is it's just all my fault everything is my fault i'm just a bad person i'm just a broken person i can't figure stuff out maybe other people are better i'm broken i'm bad and when they say that what they're doing is they're releasing themselves from any responsibility to ever do anything to make the situation better i'm just broken it's all my fault everybody would be better off without me and that's that's their way out of responsibility but there's another victim card to play and that is it is everybody else's fault this is what they did to me so who's responsible there still not you still not me. They need to get their act together. They need to stop being unjust. They need to be more fair. They need to be more gracious. They just keep dumping on me. I've, I've taken all of it that I can stand. What are we saying? We're saying that we're victims and we have no responsibility. So how do we escape this? How do we actually start working so that we're not running and hiding from God? How do we deal with this insidious thing that has camouflaged itself in every single human heart and exposes itself in many ways at many times? How do we deal with this? 
And the first thing that Paul tells us, if you want to stop hiding from God, you have to stop making excuses. He says, all mouths will be silent. Every mouth will be silenced before him. You see, we want to make our case. We want to explain why our behavior is justified. We want to explain why what we did wasn't as bad as it looked. We want to explain that we really didn't have any choice. And here's the thing. If what you did was good, or what you did was good enough, then you really don't need a savior. You just need understanding. And this is a problem because that's what everybody says for everything they have done. So we need to stop making excuses. Well, if you were in my shoes, you'd have done the same thing. If I were in your shoes, I probably would have done a worse thing. That doesn't make it right. Do you see the point? Part of what we have to do if we're going to stop running from God is stop making excuses because the excuses are just a way to cover up and run from him. And the closer God gets, the more those excuses get blown away. And we're just kind of left hanging there exposed. This is the second thing we need, and that is the fear of the Lord. And this is an ancient concept. It's constant throughout Scripture. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. So what does this mean? Does it mean that we're supposed to be anxious about God? Are we supposed to panic when we come into his presence? Are we supposed to experience terror? And the answer is, of course not. That's not what it is. The fear of the Lord has to do with two words. One is respect, and the other is value. Respect and value. That's what the fear of the Lord is. So let me give you an illustration. I'm going to ask you to time travel back to when you were an adolescent living at home with your parents and you had a curfew. Now, let's just check. Is there anybody in the room this morning that is willing to acknowledge before God and this company here gathered that you missed at least one curfew? And uh, how many are likewise willing to acknowledge that there were occasions in which you missed a curfew that it wasn't completely out of your control. <laughs> so what, what happens there? All right, so you got a curfew, and you're kind of noticing, and you're looking at your watch, or now I guess your phone, and, and so you kind of know what the time is, and if I leave right now, I could make it, and then you make a decision. And what's the decision? I'm not leaving. <laughs> and this is what everybody thinks. They think it's because I'm having more fun here than I will have at home. My parents are no fun. When I get home, I've got to go to bed. That's not fun. I'm going to stay here. And it has nothing to do with fun. That's the biggest mistake we make. We think it's, it has nothing to do with fun. It is a fear. It's a respect and a value. I'm afraid if I leave this party right now, my friends will think less of me. I'm afraid if I leave this party right now, they will think that my parents have too much control of me. I'm afraid if I leave this party right now, I won't be in certain inner circles that I need to be a part of. I'm afraid if I leave this party right now, I won't get invited to the next party because those invitations come later in the party. They don't start right out. You don't walk in and say, by the way. No, no, you wait until later. And our fear of not being popular and our fear of not being connected and our fear of being left out, our, our respect for these people, which is greater than for the people who actually take care of us. We value their opinion more than we value our parents' opinion. So we just ignore the clock because we know our parents will be annoyed, but we can live with their disapproval. We can't live with our friends' disapproval. And that's a problem. Because now what's happening is, that's what real fear is. I respect them more. I value them more. And what God says is when 